All right, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> if you're expecting a theological masterpiece, you came to the wrong lesson. I want to be practical this morning. <clears throat> um, my heart's desire is to be a help, a big help. Um, last year, many of you remember, I was praying for revival for me personally. Had been at my wit's end last year. Anybody been at your wit's end? <laughs> and, uh, and part of the answer of how God answered that prayer is what I want to bring you today. I want to teach a lesson on a subject called margin, margin. And uh, <clears throat> my intention really is that by the end of this lesson, that you allow the grace of God to give you permission to do one or all of the three. Number one, rest physically, refuel mentally, or give your permission to revive spiritually. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege to be saved. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for everything, for everyone. Lord, when we really stop and think about everything, you are so good to us. And we have not been given what we really deserve. And so thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, God, for sustaining, for helping, especially when we're at a very low point in our lives. And I pray that this message would help someone to regain traction, to regain uh, energy, life, and uh, would you use it to help in Jesus' name? Amen. First Thessalonians chapter five. First Thessalonians chapter five. Um, a very familiar verse. Uh, we're just going to touch here real quickly. First Thessalonians five, and uh, I'm going to go a little bit uh, fast because. Out of 14 pages of notes, I had to cut down because we don't have time to go over everything I wanted to say. Uh, but uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Another <laughs> word for the word soul in the 1828 dictionary is mind. And in the definition of soul in the 1820 dictionary, it says that part of man which enables him to think and reason that happens in our minds. The understanding which takes place in our minds. The intellectual principle which takes place in our minds. Internal power, grandeur of mind, nobleness of mind, a familiar compilation of a person but often expressing some qualities of the mind. So in 1 Thessalonians 5, we have God breaking down Man's three-part being, soul, or, or spirit, soul, and mind, and the body. And these are the three areas that I want to touch on as we discuss this vital subject of margin. So what is margin? What does the Bible say about it? What are some examples? And then lastly, what can we do to get more of this precious commodity? So number one, what is margin? How many like to read? Okay, good. <laughs> You're scared me for a minute. <laughs> How many enjoy having margins in your text? <clears throat> it's not something we typically think about, you know, having uh, a margin. These are beautiful blank spaces of margin. Imagine for a moment, imagine for a moment what life would be reading a book without margin. Imagine reading all your books without margin. You know what that brings? Chaos and stress. Kind of like a lot of lives today. <coughs> Chaotic and stressful because there's no margin. When we speak of margin today, brethren, we are not going to be speaking of margin from a financial standpoint, like margin trading, uh, initial deposits, and profit margins. And nor are we going to be talking about margin from our books. The margin we're going to discuss today briefly is the freedom that permits rest without guilt. <clears throat> freedom that permits rest without guilt. If we are overloaded, we have no margin. Margin prevents and treats overload. Ever been overwhelmed? Have you ever been overloaded? Yeah, a lot of hands are up. Mine as well. According to Dr. Richard Swenson, margin is the space that once existed between ourselves and our limits. Overload is not having time to finish the book you are reading on stress. 
Margin is having time to read it twice. Overload is fatigue. Margin is energy. Overload is red ink. Margin is black ink. Overload is hurry. Margin is calm. Overload is anxiety. Margin is security. It is something held in reserve for contingencies or unanticipated situations. <clears throat> is there any chalk up here? No? Okay. I can't wait till we have that monitor because I have a lot of visuals that I want to use, but just, just not going to be able to do that. But power, just think with me a minute, power minus load equals margin. It's not a math class, don't worry. But power, what's power? Power is like your energy, skills, faith, strengths, and time. You're going to have to track with me because <laughs> I'd love to have you have the visual. Oh, you got it here? Let me just, uh, so we got power minus load equals margin. So again, power, that's your, that's your, that's your time. That's your strength, your faith, your energy. That's power. The load is your work, your problems, your debts, your conflicts. Can anybody relate? When our load is greater than our power, we enter into what's called negative margin status or overload. Overload at an ex for an extended period of time is what we call burnout. This is what I was experiencing last year. And it's only by the grace of God that I'm here today because of these principles and thank the Lord for them. So let's look at some biblical examples of margin. Turn with me to Mark 6 and Isaiah 40. Mark chapter 6 and Isaiah 40. Mark chapter 6 and Isaiah 40. There's three main, there's a lot of takeaways from margin, but I want to just focus on three today. The first one is we need to rest Physically, we need to rest physically. Mark 6, look at verse 31. And he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going and they had no leisure so much as to eat. So here's a little bit of background. The disciples had been busy working in the ministry and teaching. They were so busy that they were not eating properly. A very important leader and friend in their life had just died. Their good friend in the ministry, John the Baptist, was now off the scene, having been beheaded in prison. Verse 29, the disciples heard of John the Baptist's death, and they very respectfully gave him a proper burial. Verse 30, the disciples told Jesus that what they had done, and I hadn't seen this before, and what they talked. Isn't that interesting? In other words... In this horrible situation where the, there was a death of a loved one, they kept teaching and the people were still getting help. It was with this background that the Lord said in verse 31, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Brethren, here's the Lord's prescription of margin for overloaded, weary, sorrowful, but faithful disciples of the Lord apart the word apart means separately at a distance basically in a different geographical location temporarily so be in a different place temporarily it says a desert place a desert place obviously there was much literal desert in the region of israel if you've been there you know this or from pictures but there's something to say about a deserted place where there's less distractions like no cell phone, like no email, uh, no TV, temporarily. Be in a deserted place temporarily. And then it says, rest a while, rest a while. This was a special season because it was direly needed. Sometimes we, we need margin as prevention, but sometimes we need margin as treatment. And sometimes we need it as both. Get physical rest you say but preacher the bible says love not sleep how how many have ever 
battled with that in your mind over this issue? Am I the only one? Okay, a couple of us. I just want to show you real quickly. This is, we're not going to stay here long, but in Proverbs 20, verse 13, it says, love not sleep. Look at the context or listen to the context. Love not sleep, because I think the enemy tries to wear us out. Doesn't he say in Jan, uh, De Daniel 7, 25, he tries to wear out the saints. If he can't get you into gross sin, he'll try to get you doing so much good that you get worn out. So Proverbs 20, verse 13 says, love not sleep. And then it says, watch this. Here's the context. Lest thou come to poverty, open thine eyes and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Who's he talking to? He's talking to lazy people who don't work. He's not talking to faithful, diligent, hardworking disciples. Mm -hmm. That's who he's saying love, not sleep to the lazy ones that all they do is spend time in bed and don't get to work. Right. It's a different context. So he's not talking to us that work hard, right? So love, not sleep. That, that, that's, that's a, the enemy tries to throw that at us. Because the Bible says in Psalm 127 too, he says he gives his beloved sleep. And I believe the Bible says something about the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat much or little. So brethren, we need to rest physically and not feel guilty about it. Now, if you're lazy, you should feel guilty and you should get to work and then you can, <laughs> then you can enjoy rest. You won't feel guilty by taking a nap if you're, if you're actually laboring. So anyway, number two, so not only do we need to rest physically, number two, we need to refuel mentally. Turn to, uh, so you're in Isaiah 40, turn to Matthew 11, we're going to go there next. But in Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40 and verse 29, some familiar verses here. Isaiah 40 verse 29 says, he giveth power to the faint, thank God, and to them that have no might. He increases strength. Look at verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall what? renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint don't turn there but in hebrews 12 it talks about we can faint in our minds and a major key and, and the bible says don't be soon shaken in mind right a major key to regaining strength to a weary mind and renewing strength is waiting upon the Lord. Amen. Many times when I've heard messages on, on, on this, on waiting, everything, we always go to the definition of wait as serve, as a waiter. Okay, we do need to serve the Lord, but this message is not on serving the Lord. This is about resting so you can serve more effectively. But that's one of the last definitions in 1828 about, about waiting. But listen to what some of the first definitions of wait is. To suspend any business, to stay or rest in expectation, to stop or remain stationary till the arrival of some person or event. You could really preach on the second coming of Christ right there. But sitting still physically doesn't mean that we're mindless. I find it interesting, brethren, that there's an, there's an interesting connection between rest and learning. We have an intellectual need. And many years ago, the Lord gave me this epiphany, like, wow, uh, you're not really feeding intellectually. But when I started going to school, and, and I'm not advocating school for everyone, but, but there's something about reading and, and learning that gives you uh, a confidence and a rest that, that you wouldn't have otherwise. In Matthew 11, Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, okay. just really briefly, <clears throat> Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Yes. Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Notice that rest, the two words rest, are sandwiched in between the word learn. Rest, learn, rest. It's just kind of interesting for me. One of the ways that we find rest uh, mentally is by learning. Now it seems counterintuitive, but ignorance is the cause of much frustration. We could go into a whole message just on that. I know Brother David could as well. So when is the last time, brother, sister, that you just carved out some time out of your busy life and sat still and began reading a good book? 
You say, I don't like to read. I, I, I am a slow reader. That's me too. So it's a discipline. But once you learn the discipline, it becomes like a healthy addiction. <laughs> amen. Uh, okay, that's number one, Nikki. I'm counting my amens after last. <laughs> she said, after I, after I taught last time, she says, uh, you said amen 27 times. I'm like, amen. <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. But, uh, you know, thank God for people in our lives that, that correct us lovingly, amen, so we can what? So we can grow. We can get better, amen? I appreciate that. Five. <laughs> there we go. Could be worse. Anyway, I love you too. <laughs> All right. So, by the way, if anyone here suffers socially, like you're just not very a social animal, you know what you can do? Read a good book. Because you know what will happen? Is you'll be like, brother, I just read this story and I have to share it. Yeah. Amen. Has anyone experienced that? Yeah. You want to be full? Much reading doth make a man full. Um, reading, according to Jim Rohn, is, is essential for those who seek to rise above the ordinary. One of my favorite quotes is, uh, on reading is by Mark Twain. Listen closely. The man who does not read good books is no better than the man who can't. Wow. The Prince of Preachers, Charles H. Spurgeon, by the way, when he was early, early in his life, he was uh, developing the habit of reading six books a week. I'm not there yet, but I'll tell you what, it's, it, um, wow. um, um, it, that's appealing to me. He said this, Spurgeon said this, I can only think with my own brains and feel with my own heart, and therefore I must educate my intellectual and emotional faculties. He also said this, give yourself to reading. The man who never reads will never be read. He who never quotes will never be quoted. He who will not use the thoughts of other men's brains proves that he has no brains of his own. You need to read. Amen. Amen. Uh, pastor Paul Chapel, many of you know, um, <clears throat> very good friend of our church and our pastor. Many years ago, he, uh, he's a type A, as you know. I mean, the work that God's done through him is absolutely incredible. But he's very, very go, 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 schedule, schedule, schedule. And in 27 days, uh, he, was, he had been preaching like 23 days straight. And he get, got up to preach. He got up to teach uh, his, his congregants and whatnot. And he thought he was having a heart attack. They took him to the, uh, the ER. And uh, the Christian doctor said, if you don't get rest, you will die. And um, a non-saved uh, cardiologist said that you need to go rest and you need to do it in good conscience. As a result of that 30-day uh, sabbatical he took, because the doctors prescribed it, 30 days alone with his wife, with his Bible, some notepads, and about 30 books, if I remember, he actually wrote this book as a result called Stewarding Life. Mm. This is not a plug for a book, but I'm just saying that um, it, was a, it's, it, was, it was very, very powerful. And as a result of that also, he came up with what I use as my RU journal. For those of you that do RU, this is my RU journal because it's one year a journal for the entire year and so I just adapted it and it's very practical for me uh, much instead of buying a bunch of different journals I just use that one and so that all came because a man found margin mm -hmm. a man found margin a, 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 a great man and so a life-threatening trial gave him the permission to get the rest he was needing before burnout took place <clears throat> There's a quote in here, uh, Brother Chapel says this, on the opposite end of the spectrum from the squanderers are the spenders, those who spend God's resources without allowing them to be replenished. Often the motivation is right. We want to selflessly give to others, but the method is wrong. We are failing to depend on God by ignoring his built-in cycles of rest and renewal. If we give without being replenished, we will eventually be empty. Yep. 
Margin deals with not only resting physically and refueling mentally, but also reviving spiritually. Turn with me to Mark chapter 3 and Luke 10. Mark chapter 3 and Luke 10. We need to revive spiritually. Revive spiritually. And by the way, if we don't get margin, especially at, at, the, at this point of, of overload, we will be spiritually good for no one. I don't know how I know that so well. Uh, and so Mark 3 and Luke 10. Um, actually, let me just show you something really quick. This is something on stress. This is really interesting. This is called the human function curve. Have you guys ever seen this? Do you understand that stress is important for productivity? To this point. But guess what? If we go beyond that, we go into what? We go into fatigue. And then after fatigue, we go into exhaustion. And then the beginning parts of exhaustion is called the critical point of burnout. I wonder if less preachers would be quitting their churches if they just had more margin. I wonder if less families would be giving up on each other if they just had more margin. And just fill in the blanks. So we also need to revive spiritually. In Mark chapter 3, really interesting verse to me. Uh, before the disciples were sent out to preach, there was an interesting, subtle prerequisite the Lord put on them. Mark 3, verse 14, it says, He ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. Notice that he wanted their fellowship before their service. He that would be used more publicly must invest invest more privately. Before we'll be effective in our spirit-filled work, not just ministry, family, or business, we must first spend valuable time with the Lord. Amen. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. <laughs> Luke chapter 10. I know a lot of this may just, you know, be uh, common knowledge, <clears throat> but sometimes it's the timing. And in the, in the context of margin, I think it's important. Not only that we get physically rested, that we strengthen ourselves mentally so we're not empty, so we can be effective in our service, but that reviving spiritually. Because all, it all comes down to our walk with the Lord. Amen? As Christians, it all comes down to that, that, that abiding relationship. There's nothing more important than your morning devotions. One of the first things I learned as a baby Christian is don't let anything steal your devotional time. And when I was in the Navy and some of you guys were in the military and you're on crazy watches and cold and all kinds of things. And I remember going back uh, three in the morning. It was it was actually it was really Camp Roberts. Or something. It was actually very cold. I was cold. Can you imagine that? And uh, went back there. And I mean, I was so tired. I was I was in my uh, sleeping rack, sleeping bag and everything. And I just tried to read the proverb the best I could and then just boom, fell asleep. But you know what? Sometimes you're not going to have hour-long devotions. Sometimes you're not going to have 30-minute devotions. Sometimes it may be a couple seconds. But it's not the length that matters. What matters is the heart, the motive, the yeah. diligence, because you love the Lord. So it's not how, how much, but it's, it's, it's who you're spending time with. Luke chapter 10, look at verse 38. Uh, beginning in verse 38, it says, Now it came to pass as they went, as they entered into a certain village, and a certain uh, woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost not thou care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bitter therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. <clears throat> a couple quick observations about this. The Lord Jesus loved this family, loved Mary and Martha, and loved their brother Lazarus, who he later would raise from the dead. Martha was a good, faithful, hard worker. She was busy doing the ministry. She was doing a good work. But she was overwhelmed and she was overloaded with cares and troubles and, and, and don't get me wrong, brethren, we're going to have trials. We're going to have problems. I get that. But she was busy serving for the Lord, but neglected. She was neglecting. God, God pointed this out to her. She was neglecting 
to see the priority of spending time with her Lord. Amen. And brother, we cannot go the distance in the Christian life, or in any life for that matter, on empty. Mary, on the other hand, was also a good faithful worker for the Lord. She was serving with Martha. We know that because in verse 40, Martha said, Mary hath left her. She said she left me to serve alone. That means Mary was with Martha. So she was also a faithful, diligent uh, uh, worker in the ministry, of course. But Martha was judging her sister's motive. And she actually started blaming the Lord. Don't, don't you care, Lord? So when we don't have margin, we begin to do things that we wouldn't normally want to do. Mary didn't leave Martha so that she would have to serve alone. Mary left serving temporarily because it was time for spiritual margin. Time to spend time with the Lord. Amen? <laughs> yes. We need to spend time with the Lord, with the Word of God. So it was time to revive spiritually by spending personal time with the Word of God. Amen. So priorities are being addressed because the Lord said one thing is needful, referring to sitting peacefully, hearing the Word of God. Amen. And don't we today, brethren, have so many distractions but I just got to check my emails. Right? I'm that way too. But you know what? We got to be careful to, to carve out time to show who we truly love. If we love the Lord, we're going to carve out time and we're going to spend time with Him. And nothing's going to come between that. It's a fight. But it's worth it. The servant in the ministry was good, Martha. But it was more important to hear His word. I want you to get that. It's important to serve the Lord, but it's more important to be with the Lord. A lot of times when I'm uh, working with young uh, Christians or whatnot, and they're zealous and they're wanting to jump in the bus ministry and jump into this ministry, a lot of times I'll advise them to give it a year. Get some roots down before you try expecting a bunch of fruit. Let's get the roots down deep in your abiding with the Lord. Get some strength, inner strength from the Lord before you try to go win the world for Christ. Some new Christians burn out because they get so entrenched in the serving, but neglect the feeding from the word. They get overwhelmed feeling guilty if they should back down out of ministries. This is a dangerous trap. Especially if you want to be in this thing for long term. In Isaiah 30, Israel was not trusting the Lord. They were putting their trust in Pharaoh and in Egypt. And uh, verse 7, I, mean, I don't know if you want to look at this or, or just write it down for later, but in Isaiah 30, verse 7, six words caught my attention. Listen to this. He's talking to Israel, and the principle is he's talking to us. He says, their strength is to sit still. Now, for those of us that have like pretty active personalities, and want, we want to go after it and go, 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 go. Sitting still is like, uh, sitting still? Why? I got too much to do, <laughs> right? But it says there's strength. You get strength by sitting still. And in verse 15, uh, nine words in the middle of a verse jumped out at me. It says, listen, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. You want more strength? Maybe just be quiet and have some alone time with a good book, with the Lord. And just be quiet and give yourself some rest physically, mentally, and spiritually. So, generally speaking, when we are still and quiet and focused, we entertain and engage with and enjoy the principal thing, which is what? Wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. When we are moving too fast through life without margin, we miss opportunities to receive strength, physical rest, mental replenishment, and spiritual reviving, where we could actually be a bigger blessing to someone else because we're not empty, physically, mentally, or spiritually. So lastly, how to get margin? How do we get it? Schedule it. What doesn't get scheduled, doesn't get done. Mm -hmm. Schedule an annual vacation. 
Oh, you have vacation hours, you just don't use them. Guilty. Yeah. <laughs> I've been guilty too. Take a, take a vacation or take, get, go to a spiritual conference. I remember as, as a baby Christian, probably for the first 20 years being saved, a principle that I was constantly living by was every year go somewhere where you're having a spiritual vacation. Go to a conference, spiritual conference, pastor's conference, a mission, missionary conference, uh, spiritual leaders conference, whatever. Go get fed spiritually, but get rest physically at the same time. Make it a vacation. That's great advice. Uh, especially for baby Christians. Get in the habit of being spiritually replenished annually. But then also, when's the, anybody like camping? When's the last time you went camping? When's the last time you just sat somewhere with a campfire and just, okay, for the Marines, they don't want to go camping because it reminds them of work. It reminds them of work. All right, but some of you like camping. But find what it is for you where you get that rest. Uh, schedule times to read alone or date your spouse or date the Lord. Amen. Spend time dating the Lord. Or how about dating your kids? <laughs> Teach your kids by modeling what to look for in a mate. Well, I got quiet on that one. All right. <laughs> Schedule daily devotions. Daily. We eat daily. Most of us eat daily. We need, to eat, we need to eat spiritually daily too. So, as we close, get physical rest. The doctors say seven to eight hours a night. You say, Brother Brent, how in the world in this fast paced am I supposed to get seven or eight hours of sleep? It's, it, that's exact, he's, he's exactly right. Go to bed early. You ever heard the old adage, early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise? Why? I'll tell you, it's been, it's, it's a struggle to do that, especially when you're wired to just keep going late at night. And, uh, but that's what we need to do. Get, go to bed early, get some sleep, refuel mentally, turn off the news before you go to bed. Yes. Refuel your mind. Don't pollute your mind. Most news is a negative roller coaster anyway. Turn off the TV, off the phone, enjoy the presence of the Lord, your family, and a good book. Turn on some nice music. Make it a special occasion. Schedule and plan to read books. I'm reading about 10 books right now at the same time. I've got about 60 books that I want to go through. Um, but this is something I learned from last year. I was not replenishing and I was dying. And then revive spiritually. Listen to preaching. Listen to podcasts. Listen to audiobooks. books. Uh, schedule times, uh, again, to be with the Lord. And then lastly, I have a handout here if anyone is interested I think this is this is really a, a handy tool I use this in my coaching it's called the balance of life it's a priority rating what you do there are the seven basic areas in our life rate yourself one to ten and to see where you are f in your fulfillment how you doing spiritually oh um, ten <laughs> or I'm one it shows you an area your areas where you need to get more margin Okay, so I have these uh, on the back if you want, and I'm done. <laughs>